right. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our first virtual monthly social here in Vancouver. I hope everyone is from Vancouver. If not, it's all good as well. I mean, like, this is the online world where we can get everyone together. So it's great. Um, thank you all for taking the time to be here today with us. Uh, we have exciting and insightful discussions for tonight. Uh, just be aware that uh, tonight's event will be recorded, okay? Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment and recognize that Passive House Canada acknowledges the ancestral and unceded territories of the all Maltese, Inuit, and First Nations that call this land home. Uh, if today is your first day here with us, I mean, like not only to this event, I'd like to let you know that it's important for you to understand um, who Passive House Canada is, right? So we are a national nonprofit professional association advocating membership based for the Passive House High Performance Building Standard. Our mission is to make the international Passive House Standard of Building Performance understood, achievable, and adopted by government, industry, professionals, and the public across the country through education, advocacy, events, and building projects. If you don't know me by now, my name is um, Luis Bezerra. I'm the Manager of Education, Training, and Development at Passive House Canada. Certified Passive House Designer and a uh, Civil Engineer. Uh, I'm excited to be joining you for today's event as your host. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to pass it on to our leader and our CEO, Chris Spellard, to say a few words and welcome you all. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Luis, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, this great event here in Vancouver. I know we're all dying for the day when we can get together and, uh, and, and hoist a cup of tea or perhaps something stronger and uh, talk all things Passive House. Uh, but for now, it will have to be a virtual world. So again, I wanna thank you and I, I wanna thank all the folks from Passive House Canada, all the team that are here with us tonight. Uh, I'll let Louise tell you a little bit more about Passive House Canada, but uh, indeed we are uh, the largest uh, Passive House advocacy uh, and training organization in this country. One of the largest actually in the world something that we should all brag about. Uh, I always like to brag about the fact that uh, uh, Passive House uh, has its DNA, its roots right here in Canada. If you don't know our history, uh, check out the Saskatchewan uh, Conservation House from 1977 and the wonderful uh, Harold Orr, uh, who is a, uh, a recipient of the Order of Canada. That's how deep our roots are in Canada. Uh, and I'm always excited to share that with people and really get us uh, uh, hyped and proud about uh, the Passive House movement uh, internationally, but the Passive House movement here in Canada. And one of the last things you need to know, and then I'll stop and turn things back to Luis, uh, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to listening to uh, Monty tonight. Hey, Monty, good to see you again, um, is that uh, the United Nations at the recent COP26 uh, have uh, cited uh, Passive House Canada as a center of excellence. We've been recognized as a center of excellence for uh, zero uh, emission, high performance buildings. And again, as Canadians, that's something we should all be very proud of. We have great roots here in Canada, and I look forward to working with you to grow the movement uh, even more across this great country of ours. So back to you, Louis, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here tonight. Thank you, Chris. Uh, what more to say about Passive House, right, Canada? Uh, thank you very much for the, the great introduction. Um, for tonight, I'm going to be I'm going to start by providing a brief overview of today's event. Uh, we'll be inviting our sponsor, Siga, to say a few words, followed by our featured speaker, Monty Polson of RDH, which I'll introduce later. If you don't know this figure already, you probably do. So it's going to be just myself repeating. So after Monty's presentation, we will open the floor to any questions, followed by some smaller group and networking in breakout rooms to give you all the opportunity to get to, one, to get to know one another if you already don't. So I'd like to, first of all, thank SIGA to be our sponsors in tonight's event. And uh, SIGA is a manufacturer, developer, and distributor of air and wind tight products for building construction. They strive for the world of zero energy loss buildings. I will now pass it over to Andrew Luck, one of BC trainers for SIGA to introduce themselves and say a few words. Andrew, take it on, my friend. 
Thanks, Luis. Um, yeah, you just kind of introduced us already. For those who don't know, we are a Swiss company. Uh, we, 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 we work with a lot of passive house projects in all over the world in 40 plus different countries. I'm happy to, uh, to be involved for organization like Passos Canada. Um, we love to see passionate people like yourself, and we love seeing passion and grow and see market grow. Um, something that's pretty new, I guess, uh, in, in the BC market, we actually recently opened a uh, training center that is really cool. We, we do still have an event schedule at the end of February. It's on February 24th. Um, finger crossed uh, it's still happening. Uh, no, no, but it's free. Um, you're welcome to come by for a couple hours. It's an open house event for a couple hours in the afternoon uh, where we will have a lot of vendors. We'll have a lot of fun games set up um, where you can come by and really just network and meet people who finally shake their hand a little bit if if COVID allowed us to. And uh, it will be a great chance for us to get together. It's in Coquitlam, it's very local. It's near United Boulevard. Yeah, so if you are interested, um, you can Google with Sika Eventbrite and it's the sign up link is on there or, or you can email me and I can I can sign you up from there. But that's uh, pretty much all I have. Looking forward to the presentation from Monty. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, man, I hope we can be all together there. I'll, I'll make sure I'll, I'll be there. I mean, like I'm, looking forward to any kind of in-person event right now. So um, I hope to see some familiar faces as well. Thank you for the introduction. So now uh, joining us this evening is our guest speaker, Monty Polson, a passive house specialist at RDH Building Science. We'll be discussing the statistical impact of climate change and how to retrofit buildings in a climate emergency. If you have any questions during his presentation, I'm trying to make Monty's, uh, let's say, well-spread curriculum very short now, so we don't waste a lot of time on this one. But uh, if you do have any questions, type on the chat or just keep for yourself, because at the end, we would like to hear your voice, to see your face. And uh, Monty, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, it's always a pleasure, you know, hearing your presentation and to have you around. Thank you, buddy. Thank you very much. And as usual, we always had the first one. You're muted, Blake. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Great. Yeah. yeah. Screen. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, I said yes to this because I was so excited about doing the first in-person social coming back in. And yet here we are still virtually. And that sort of feels like the year. Um, let's see which advanced trick to use here. Use this one. So I'm going to kind of hit five points here. This idea that there really is no new normal, talk about what's happening here in BC. These photos are from Lytton, by the way, last summer. Talk about how things are gonna get worse with climate. Talk about the idea that every building needs a plan. The idea is to prepare for what's happening to climate change and not wait until you're flooded or burned before you start making your plans. To talk about how Enerfit provides a great template and is very similar to the way we do comprehensive plans for larger buildings. And I wanna end talking about how retrofits can be a form of hope. Um, Louise mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to say it again. We do live, work, and play. Uh, myself, on unceded territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Not only do they own the place, they were living and building wood frame, mass timber, multifamily, affordable housing 14,000 years ago on this site. When my ancestors were still basically living in caves, they were throwing giant parties and wind freight buildings. And I think there's an awful lot we can learn from the coastal First Nations about um, construction and residential living. So from time to time, you hear somebody in the news saying, oh, this is the new normal. This is how things are gonna be. And I, I urge you to just keep reminding yourself, there is no new normal. There will never be a new normal in our lifetime. Climate change is accelerating dramatically and will continue to accelerate till the end of the century at least. Uh, there is no, unlike the pandemic, there's no point when this comes to an end. It just gets worse every year for the rest of our lives. The earth has already warmed about 1.2 degrees on average. That does not mean in a local situation. Land on average has warmed about 1.8 degrees. And Northwest Canada, along with parts of Northern Russia, are warming faster than most of the rest of the world. We're seeing real accelerated warming in the north. We're probably seeing an Arctic that'll be 10 degrees warmer by mid-century. And when we look at the effects, the first one we really saw here in BC, of course, was the mountain pine beetle. At about half the warming we've had now, at about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 degrees global warming, these beetles began surviving through the winter. And they didn't, they, they've always been around, but they used to die off during colder winters. Um, now they're surviving more. 
And by about 0.8 degrees Celsius of warming, pretty much every region of the BC Terrier had been infected. And so there's a heck of a lot of dead wood in our forest lands. By about one degree, slightly less than one degree, wildfires became a part of every single summer in BC and across much of North America, in large part driven by the bugs. So you have the bugs to the fire. And at 1.2 degrees, as most of you remember last summer, the town of Lytton burned to the ground during a heat wave that was made stronger and more possible by global warming because as that Arctic air heats up, the jet stream is no longer this stable fence that holds the Arctic from the subarctic. And the jet stream becomes kind of loopy and weak, and it would create these giant spots where the heat would move up or the cold would come down in the wintertime. And so these intense heat domes like we had is definitely a function of climate change. And during that heat dome, 600 British Columbians died, most of them in their homes, all of them in buildings. In the fall, still at about 1.2 degrees of warming, we had these atmospheric rivers. Many of you remember carrying huge amounts of water. And the key to remember is we've always had atmospheric rivers. That's why salmon spawn in fall, but they used to be like nine or 10 degrees. And this one, they were up in the range of 20 degrees, uh, 22.5 in Penticton during the atmospheric river or a little later. Um, air that is 20 degrees Celsius holds twice the water of air of 10 degrees Celsius. And these rivers were carrying twice, or in some cases more than twice, the average rainfall of these kind of things, simply from that fundamental fact that warm air cold air is, carries more water than cold air. And we saw the effects of that. Those rivers hit clear cuts, either from forestry or from fires, cleared the four cut, clear cuts out and created these giant mudslides. There were so many mudslides that the highway, the, the Coquihalla and our other highways were cut in more than 20 places. So it wasn't just one or two, it was huge amounts of cuts that were very deep. Again, because of this combination of beetles, fires, forestry, and atmospheric rivers all piling up one after each other. Um, we were cut off from Canada by road, as most of you remember for a while. And then shortly thereafter, the Fraser Valley flooded three times in three weeks, with continued getting pounded by these warmer uh, atmospheric rivers. Um, more than 640,000 farm animals died. This picture in particular has caught my eye because I realized that that part of our province, the Fraser Valley, is home to an awful lot of very, very conservative uh, British Columbians, conservative Canadians. On average, they tend to not think about climate change a whole lot. Some don't fully believe in it. They have a different orientation. But if you're on your jet ski towing your cow, it doesn't really matter if you believe in climate change or not. Your life's changed. And that's kind of the situation we're all in. This idea of, of belief uh, is no longer an issue as we're actually grappling with it. And of course, just a few weeks ago, at still 1.2 degrees of warming, we saw that we're experiencing a 75 degree, degree swing from hot to cold this year. Lytton went from almost 50 degrees in the summer to minus 25 in the same year. And many other cities and towns across British Columbia had similarly really large swings. Again, reminding us that climate change isn't all warming. It is disruption and changes to these patterns, particularly the jet stream because of that warmer Arctic. I want you to take away the sequence, bugs to forests, to fires, to mudslides. Um, these cascade effects are the hallmark of runaway climate disruption. This is exactly what climate scientists have been warning us about for about 30 years. Um, another runaway effect, well, we think of sea level rise as happening on the coast, but as sea level rise pushes up groundwater, we're going to see flooding far more inland than we expected in certain types of rock formations. And we're going to see, as we mentioned, hotter summer peaks and colder winter peaks, both happening with more frequency as we move forward. And all of this in one of the mildest places on Earth. If you were to pick a place to move to, to survive climate change for the next 100 years, British Columbia would be on the top of the list. This is a graphic put together showing where the change in temperatures will result in areas more like humans evolved with, the studies cited there in the source. Um, so even when the safest places on Earth, we're dealing with fairly catastrophic climate change on a very regular basis, uh, much of the rest of the world would literally die for the amount of water we're receiving in these atmospheric rivers. And as other parts become drier and drier, we're anticipating more than 3 billion people will probably be migrating out of the central zones of Africa and, and parts of South America, probably north or south to places like British Columbia. And that's at 1.2 degree one. We're about to double that fairly quickly, possibly within 15 or 20 years. There are four key greenhouse gases that drive climate change. 
Um, carbon dioxide, as you know, is by far the largest one. It's the biggest impactor. There's more of it out there than anything else. We describe carbon dioxide because it's the primary greenhouse gas as having a global warming potential of one. It's the baseline we talk about. When we talk about methane, which comes, it is what uh, so-called natural gas is methane. A lot of agricultural emissions are methane. A lot of emissions from wetlands, including the entire tundra region across the Arctic is methane. It has a global warming potential of 25, meaning you know, one twenty-fifth of methane produces the same damage and produces it faster than carbon dioxide, although it lasts in the atmosphere less long. Nitrous oxide, smaller in total amount than methane, has a tremendous global warming potential of 298, and so watching it is tremendously important. And fluorinated gases, which are primarily in refrigerants, have global warming potentials from 14,000 to 22,000 times as damaging as carbon dioxide. And so our leakage from refrigerants in buildings is a huge issue. Um, and as many of you know, many ref uh, cooling techs uh, drive around in their truck with big tanks of fluorinated gases that they just recharge and recharge and recharge and dismiss the old stuff on a fairly routine basis. So we're putting a lot of stuff out. For now, over the last several decades, the oceans have been absorbing a lot of heat. Uh, you can look at this chart for how much heat has come in, especially in that top 700 meters of oceans. We don't know how much longer they're going to keep absorbing it and when they're going to start releasing it back to the land. And that's one of the tipping points scientists are watching. Just to put that in context, the oceans are heating at a rate equivalent to a nuclear bomb every second, five nuclear bombs every second. That means by the end of this maybe one hour event, the oceans will have warmed the equivalent of 18,000 nuclear bombs, more than the global stockpile currently exists of nuclear weapons. It's a lot of energy being stored up in the ocean, and we're not clear where that's going to go. If we want to say who put this there, on a per capita basis, Canadians have put more CO2 into the atmosphere than any other people on Earth, including Americans, uh, Australians, Russians, and others. That's per capita. We have put more over history. British Columbia in particular is rising and it, our emissions are driving up faster than Canada and faster than other G7 nations, um, driven in part by our oil and gas um, projects in the northern parts of the province. And all of this has led us to two targets we hear about a lot in the news. Um, we often talk about these targets by 2030, uh, economies, countries wanna get 40 to 45% below a 2005 baseline. That's something Canada's committed to and many other committees, uh, countries are committed to. Tragically, the science tells us it's not enough to close the gap. You'll also hear a lot of countries and, and uh, companies talking about z net zero by 2050. Even the oil companies are on board with net zero by 2050 because net zero by 2050 is too late. And they, it's basically an excuse to kick this can down the road another 20, 30 years and not really deal with it. I would urge you when you hear 20, net zero by 2050 to think of it as greenwashing. It's not a serious target. And targets of even 40 to 50% by 2005 aren't going to get us there. Um, so just keep that perspective in line and, and feel free to check it out yourself on Google if you disagree with me. But it's, it's worth realizing that our targets are not sufficient to the task at hand. One of the best ways to look at the task at hand is a graphic like this. And this looks at exceeding the 1.5 degree target that's been agreed on by uh, the Council of Parties and others, the Paris Agreement. Back in around 2000, we could have got to this target at a 4% a year reduction, which would still be pretty steep. We have never accomplished a 4% a year reduction, not even during the pandemic, but it was entirely doable because we did nothing. And in fact, our emissions rose fairly steeply after the year 2000. Uh, our path now is nearly vertical. It requires a nearly complete shutdown of emissions of those four greenhouse gases to get there. Um, our expansion um, leads us to this really dramatic path. And the only path to achieving 1.5 is a huge dramatic cut uh, by 2030. 2030 is 95 months away from now. It means we need to cut in the range of, you know, a few percent per month ever, and we're not heading that way, we're still rising. And so I urge you to just absorb this chart and others and realize we have waited far too long to make mild, modest, temperate cuts and keep anything like the climate we've known. Now, the way Governments have gotten to this as they said, well, we're going to invent carbon capture and storage. We're going to invent technologies that pull carbon out of the air and that'll allow us to make up the difference. And they're right that it's technically possible. This is the only working carbon capture and storage plant in the world. It's in Iceland. It was put online uh, less than a year ago. It's a really interesting technology by a Swiss company that's working on it. It's called the Orca plant. It draws down the equivalent of about 790 cars a year. 
So that's it. That's all we're doing that works. Now, you may have heard about some other ones in Canada, including a plant that Shell operates in Alberta. The problem is Shell's plant and every other plant in North America is actually emitting more carbon that it's taking out, that its process isn't really working. They're taking billions in federal subsidies to investigate climate carbon capture, but none of them are actually pulling out from the air more than they're emitting, uh, including the major plants in Canada. At this point, it's basically a kind of funding boondoggle for uh, oil companies. So after COP26 um, in the fall, the experts who've kind of looked at the new pledges by governments, um, the new promises, say if they were kept, we're looking at something around two and a half degrees of heating, a little more than double what we have currently. And it'll happen this century, depending on our forecast and decisions we make, it could be as soon as the 2040s, could be as late as the 2080s. And what we know looking back, of course, is that the carbon dioxide levels are tracked by temperature quite closely. This shows both graphs on different charts, and you can see over a long period of time this relation. This graph shows up a lot. I want to just take a minute before we go into buildings and look at a larger scale. So this is about 2,000 years. Let's look back at about a million years, a few millions of years. And this is this modern era we just looked at in the last chart there. This was about where modern DNA emerged, language, farming, art, music, our sense of culture came about um, a few hundred thousand years ago. And we first evolved as humans from our kind of ape-like ancestors um, around two million years ago, something like that. The point is through this whole period of human life on earth, we were never at a two and a half degree climate. We have never been there as humans. The planet has been there back in earlier times, and you can see that from the far left hand of the chart, but living as humans on a 2.5 degree warmer climate is an entirely new exercise that's never been done. We don't really know how we're gonna do it, and we don't really know that we can do it. But to the degree we can, it's gonna depend on us living in shelters and living in completely different ways than we have lived. And key to that is gonna be buildings. We're gonna need buildings that protect us from a much more uh, difficult climate, a hotter climate, a colder climate, huge amounts of precipitation uh, and other effects we've just kind of barely begun to see. And so the core of what I wanna to say today is every building needs a plan for that. Whether it's a pass plan or not, every building needs a plan. Every of billions, billions on earth needs a plan for how it's gonna protect people and economic activity into a radically sharpening climate. And every plan is gonna to need to be a little different. And it makes a heck of a lot more sense to do the plan now before things get worse. And that's what I wanna talk about first, the plan and how Interfit can help that. Buildings have to shelter people on a planet of more than two and a half degrees warmer, a planet twice as violent, uh, more than twice as violent that we dealt with. And while doing it, they must emit no greenhouse gases. We need to take the emissions out of the buildings completely and create zero emissions buildings. And pass files forms a pathway to that that's really useful. I happen to really admire and respect our current premier, John Horgan. I would call him a friend. Um, unfortunately, one of the things he said during the floods is these extraordinary events were not measured before, not complicated before. And that's just not true. I don't know who created that sound effect, but it was perfectly timed. Um, the, his own government in uh, July of 2019 issued a preliminary strategic climate risk assessment for British Columbia, in which it described exactly what we saw would happen. Uh, it was astonishingly accurate. They describe wildfires and smoke, extreme storms, overland flooding, sea level rise and overheating. Now, the reason I raise this is those of us who are building professionals, who are registered professionals as architects or engineers or, or other roles, we have legal responsibilities around these issues. We are accountable for the standard of care and the standard of care is defined by our, the knowledge of time. And we have been warned in this report, in the BC code and in many other uh, articles and scientific papers of what climate change is doing. Climate change imposes a new standard of care and groups like the Engineering Geoscientist Organization uh, here in British Columbia and others have written specific guidance for what we need to do. We can no longer ignore this. It's fine for politicians can pretend they didn't know. We can't, or we will soon be in court defending buildings that fail. And remember, during that heat dome, record high of almost 50 degrees in Lytton, and more importantly, the lowest low was on June 28 in Burnaby. That means the overnight low only got down to 29. As you remember, a lot of people really struggling to sleep because if your low only gets down to 20, it means most of your temperatures in your 30s, 
And more older buildings that don't have air conditioning are actually magnifying the heat. So they're hanging on to a heat that's 35, 40 degrees all night long, because there's just not enough cooling pressure outside to bring it down. And the rise in nighttime lows may have a greater influence on our ability to kind of survive heat domes than the daytime highs. There were 595 people who died from heat related causes in about a three day period that were specifically assigned to the heat dome by the coroner's offices. Almost all of them were senior citizens and 99% of them died in their own homes. They went home seeking shelter, seeking safety. Excuse me, time for another beer. They went home seeking shelter and instead their homes killed them. Similar heat domes happened these last few weeks in Argentina and Australia, same sort of phenomena. And this was all happening during a you know, La Nina year. This will be far worse the next time we have an El Nino year. And just last fall in California, a $10 million case was awarded to overheating condo owners. They sued the developer in a glass curtain wall building. The south and west units were up at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they could not cool meaningfully overnight. And uh, Inadequate ventilation as well and lack of passive cooling strategies is a big part of it. So in addition to facing deaths, we're increasingly facing lawsuits around um, overheating buildings. And before moving on, I just wanna urge us to be really precise when we talk about overheating. We naturally tend to blame problems on the latest thing that we discovered and global warming is a factor in overheating, but it's one of only six that really matters. And when we talk to clients about overheating, we always, the first thing we wanna say is let's figure out exactly why your building is overheating. Solar gain is a huge part. An awful, you can look at the buildings in downtown Vancouver, all that south and west facing glass is overheating units on a regular basis. And anybody who's lived or known somebody who's lived in those is aware of this. Uh, adjusting exterior shading, the solar heat gun coalition, uh, coefficient, blazing area and other factors are huge. Then there's that temperature. We need to be modeling for 2050 and 2080, not for 1985, which is the midpoint of the 30 year cycles we typically use for code buildings. Urban heat island effect is huge. Some parts of the city are hotter than others. And those parts that are hotter also tend to be the places that have more infill development activity. So an awful lot of our new multifamily buildings are ending up in the hottest parts of the city. I'll show a map on that on the next slide. And inside the building, we're building buildings that are more and more densely occupied. Um, occupant density is a big factor in overheating. If our uh, kind of rule of thumb guidance was planned for an era when we had lots of big three bedroom units and two or three people living in them, we now have 500, 400, 300 square foot units with two people living in them. It's a very different amount of internal heat gains. Losses through mechanical systems like domestic hot water are really focused on in passive house among other things and can be fairly surprising. And mechanical losses, the owners pay for twice. You pay once to heat the hot water and another time to run the cooling system to take the excess heat out of the building. And of course, we have lifestyle variations. You could very easily in a multi-unit building have side by side one suite where um, someone lives a very aesthetic lifestyle. Maybe they're uh, a Buddhist and they meditate and they don't have a TV and they don't have a microwave and they don't have a computer. And next door, you could have a couple who are gamers that are running gaming or mining Bitcoin operations and multiple computers running 24-7, putting off thousands of watts of heat. That's an entirely practical thing that might happen. So those two units are going to perform differently. And the delta between those units is probably greater than the delta between what side of the building you are, like west side or east side or something like that. So when we think about overheating, it works looking at these. Um, this is a map from the urban forest strategy put out by the city of Vancouver. Long story short, the, the blue zones are more like the predicted social, social the predicted surface temperature and the orange and red zones are much hotter. If you know the city of Vancouver, it's easy to see where they are. They're in more developed, more cement filled parts of town. And the blue zones are, and green zones are in more leafy tree line parts of town. Um, you need to plan for this heat as well as you model a building. And if you just look at these other factors without considering this one, you could miss several degrees that make a, a real big difference. Another adaptation, another thing we need to plan for is wildflower smoke. We've seen all the smoke in our air. Um, it's intense with wildfire, although there's tremendous amounts of pollution coming from tire particles and other things on a regular basis, but the, the wildfire smoke really captures our attention. Um, using heat recovery ventilation or really any filtered ventilation can help an awful lot. We have to adapt to sea level rise. Um, this is a map of what we could possibly have with sea level rise before any kind of diking system that would pretty much wipe out Delta, Richmond, certainly the airport. We're gonna have major billion dollar decisions to make here about whether we can dike. And even if we can dike them, will the water not just come through underneath and flood them anyway? A whole conversations we haven't really had. 
Um, but we began to see it during that last storm that threw the barge up on the beach that I still can't get on the beach, that our, our higher highs are, are hard to avoid. And it's, again, we have it far easier than places like Boston or New York, older cities that are built on fill on the Atlantic Ocean, which has a very different set of dynamics uh, affecting its height. Um, BC, while it is performing poorly, also has a fairly good plan, plan towards mitigation. And by 2030, all new buildings will be zero carbon. All new space and water heating systems meet the highest standards of efficiency, meaning 100%. What this is code for is you can't have boilers after 2030. If your boiler or furnace dies at the end of 2029, you won't be able to replace it with a new one in the building, whether an apartment building or house. And so you're going to see a wave this decade of people converting in advance to heat pumps. Um, or at least to electric resistant heating, will, which will be the new lowest low. Um, most contractors, even quite a few um, installers of gas equipment are still unaware of this. And so as something to plan for and realize is coming down the pipe, the boiler and furnace law changes that are part of um, the Clean BC plan are gonna have a huge impact on the, the community. So in, in residential settings, your typical boiler and furnace won't be available anymore. And in larger commercial buildings, your typical gas boiler won't be available. You'll just use a larger kind of heat pump. Now, we anticipate that you're going to see some owners are going to say, well, OK, fine. I'm going to go out and buy the guest best, boiler, guest best gas boiler I can. It's been a long day at uh, 2029, and that'll last me another 20 years. But there's another piece of this, that we have the Canada's federal carbon tax is stepping up $9 a gigajoule uh, to, reach my, no, no, net, to reach $9 a gigajoule by 2030. Um, this is going to change the dynamics of burning gas in your building. And you might see owners who have decided, yeah, I'm going to stick with my gas boiler. It's great. It's simple. It works fine. I don't want to touch a heat pump. But once they do the math going forward for the next 20 years of buying uh, methane through the natural gas network, they may realize that they're actually saving enough money to more than offset the cost of a heat pump in many circumstances. Um, and that's $9 a gigajoule now, there is discussion I hear in the federal government, it's not my expertise, but I hear the discussion about going further than that, more aggressive than that. And if that's true, it'll tip those economics faster. And it becomes a responsibility of any building owner to do this math along with looking at these code requirements, along with looking at these adaptation and mitigation requirements. We also see BC is about to new, launch new grants for homeowners, commercial buildings and other things. We'll try to see if they do better than their last program where we put in a lot of furnace installations that were poorly qualified or windows that were poorly installed and how we will try to avoid locking in poor performance. What I want you to do just at the end of this section before we get on the next one is imagine you're a building owner today in 2022. You've got this building, it's you, know, you own real estate in Vancouver, you're a millionaire by default, by definition. But you have these continuous cascading climate disasters, and you're aware they're making things worse. And depending on the location of your building, you may have real drainage issues already happening in your basements or parkades. You have continual escalating costs, driven in part by the global construction boom that is a function of climate change. As things get destroyed, there's more and more construction happening. It's harder to get trades during the pandemic. So you're, you're trapped in this need to do more work, and work is costing more than it ever has. You also have continually changing code requirements. Many people are just in this next year going to hear about the effectively boiler ban at the end of this decade. You have continuously changing building technology. Many people are just saying, what's a heat pump? What's a triple pane window? What's a heat recovery ventilation system? What's vacuum packed this? You know, um, It's confusing. It's an awful lot of material for people who just came building operators, or maybe they've been building operators for years, but you have to learn this. You're also faced by a massive demand for new housing, which can certainly change your performa a lot as, as rents or uh, sales rates keep going up. You have bans on gas connections or appliances in places like New York and um, Boston and others that are emerging. You have new retrofit demands. The province of BC is gonna have a retrofit code and retrofit requirements. They're drafting it now. It'll probably be out for review in about a year and probably take an effect another year after that. And then you have the rise in carbon tax and other pieces. It's tremendously confusing. It's hard to sort. And on top of this, you know, you've got a pandemic. Things are hard to work out. What we need is a plan. We need a way of planning, a way of looking at buildings, and a way of talking about buildings that we can develop strategies for uh, mitigation and adaptation. This could include looking at flooding scenarios and deciding lifting buildings, uh, re-insulating foundations, or even selling the property. Um, models for overheating and future and current climate, look at what's happening in the building and where it's like to get worse and why it's happening to be very specific. Measuring indoor air quality, uh, retrofitting, ventilation. 
mitigation. How is this building, is this project going to get to zero emissions by 2030? How does it deal with its heating and cooling and hot water needs to get there? Considering these impacts of future codes, considering the impacts of a uh, carbon tax, and then how much capital is available and when's available? It may not all be available to do this immediately. Um, there have been deep retrofit projects across BC. I could spend an hour going through them, but this is one I really like because it's a really modest size project in Victoria, BC. A huge savings, not quite to enter fit level, but a pretty deep retrofit for the time. We're receiving more requests from portfolio owners across the country who want to start drawing these plans. And what we're trying to do is, sorry, the slide's in here twice, I realize. We're trying to do to get to a new place where we take all of that chaotic stuff and we focus on building renewal needs, the comfort needs of indoor air quality and overheating and new policy mandates, feed those all into a study that's building specific, and then out of that, come up with a step-by-step -step plan. You've got all this chaotic stuff coming to you. You know what's going to happen over the next 20 years. Here's a plan that's going to allow you to implement these in a logical way that suits your capital needs and ideally to do it before the flood or heat wave arrives. When we prepare these plans at RDH for large building owners or portfolios, the process we use is astonishingly similar to the Interfit stepwise process. And if you're thinking about starting to get your head around this, I'd urge you to learn the Interfit stepwise process and insert some of the climate requirements in addition to the Interfit targets into the consideration. And you have this great planning tool to figure out how to do a mitigation adaptation plan for any building. And here in this last portion of this talk, I want to just walk through what that looks like. So more than 5,000 buildings have been upgraded to Interfit. Um, most of those are in Europe over the past few years. Here's an example from Innsbruck. And some are really deep. This particular building sawed off all those balconies. And you can see on the left-hand side there where they have those clips to thermally break the balconies for, from, the, from the building itself. Um, so there's been a lot of technology and creative architectural approaches like this one that have been developed over the last um, decade and a half of Interfit results. And we're not starting from scratch as we work these things out. The idea of stepwise Interfit is that we don't lock ourselves into low performance. We don't say, put in a giant heat pump now and then put on triple pane windows and insulation and then the heat pump's too big and it's short cycling. We, we think through the whole process where we wanna end with a clear endpoint and we plan first to that endpoint, which is where we develop this interfit retrofit plan. Then we run that by a PHI building certifier who agrees on the plan and sense great. Here's the steps we agree to doing. You can get a plaque when you've achieved about 25% of the savings. So there's some recognition for the building owner or homeowner that, yeah, they're in process. And over the next 10 or 15 years, you might do step two, step three, each one being agreed to by the plan. And then finally, you've done everything and you have an interfit certificate and recognition that you've lowered your targets to those rates. There's not another stepwise certification that I'm aware of out there. And this stepwise approach is what really makes it unique and I think worth um, adapting for a long-term piece. Typically, the building is modeled in something like uh, Design PH, a 3D energy model. Some of us are starting to use um, things like uh, Grasshopper and Revit and other 3D energy models more. And, and I think we're going to see a real blossoming and simplified energy modeling tools. This is actually an energy model of the new Bass Timber Passive House Community Center in Marple uh, here in Vancouver that's, that we're working on for uh, Diamond Schmidt Architects. Um, there's two, passes, two paths to interfit. One is the component method where while you will model the building, your certification isn't based specifically on the model results, it's based on achieving component results. This is not super easy yet because we have a relatively small pool of components, but we have the larger, largest pool here in BC as anywhere else in North America. So it's more possible. And so you would look at the zone you're in. For us, it's cool temperate. And as long as your windows, your HRVs, your wall performance met these targets, your HRV met these targets, you could certify the building. Um, we think as we get to scale, doing lots and lots of buildings to possibly interfit targets, using this component method will prove easier than using the model method. The other is you simply prepare a PHPP, it's the same as you would for a new building. The target for interfit for a cool temperate zone is 25 kilowatt hours per square meter of heating energy and cooling energy also in our climate. And that's compared to, for a new building, about 15. And it's basically recognizing that, for example, you may not dig the building out and re-insulate the underneath the foundation. But there'll be some thermal bridging and other losses that are endemic to retrofits. And so there's a little bit looser target to make up for that. There's also a slightly looser tightness target of one air changing hour at 50 pascals rather than 0.6. 
The PER demand stays the same as it does for new buildings of 60 kilowatt hours and can be adapted if you're doing a multi-unit building or something like that. So in stepwise interfit, you would model the whole building where it's going to get there at the end. And then you work yourself backwards and say, what do I do what? So in this particular sample plan, the uh, windows and heat recovery ventilation come first, then the basement um, ceiling and roof, some insulation and some PV, then some external walls and entrance door, and then at the very end, heat pump and solar storage, creating this declining plan. What I'm suggesting here, that's not part of the interfit plan, but I think is a great way to look at it, is that you add these adaptation questions at the same time and that they drive the thinking and these policy changes, these new mandates at the same time. So if you're dealing with wildfire smoke or tire particles or other pieces, you, filtered ventilation is a really important piece of your question. If you're dealing with overheating, redesign, shading, probably mechanical cooling is part of your question. If you're dealing with sea level rise or intrusion through the ground plane, um, you may need to relocate. You may not be the best site to do a new development, or you may need to lift the building, raise it up somewhat. Uh, you may need to, with extreme weather, hotter summers and cooler winters, um, you may need to re-insulate buildings and add more insulation so you can bring your mechanical costs down, but also so you create a degree of resiliency. If the power is out in a super insulated building, you have a few days before it freezes, and so you have much more time to deal with the problem than an old two by four frame building, where you know your building's gonna start freezing in four to eight hours. Um, we have water and electricity shortages we're seeing more frequently in sort of on-site generation and storage. You might not be able to run your whole building, but if you had enough on-site power to run some minimal lighting and your HRV and, you know, I, I had one client, he said, my whole goal was to be able to take a hot shower and keep my beer cold and I'm good. Everything else can go down, you know. Um, with heat waves and cold snaps, we need designs to shelter in place. And of course, for future pandemics, we might need spaces for more work at home and more uh, sharing space with teenagers and toddlers and things like that. If you look at this slide, the little red houses I've put there to the right, kind of like asterisks, those are features that happen to also be part of the passive house mandate. And I want to be really clear, passive house alone does not prepare a building for future climate. It does not, it was not designed for that. It, it meets specific heat loss, cooling loss and energy use targets. However, an awful lot of the strategies are the same strategies we need for preparing for climate adaptation and mitigation. And so by starting with Passive House as the baseline working from or Enerfit, we've kind of checked off a lot of these pieces and then we can spend more time dealing with the things that it doesn't deal with like, flooding and, and revised flooding maps and thinking about what's likely to happen here is a really key consideration. We think lots of buildings and planners need to think about looking at where on-site generation and storage and where working with the grid makes is another really important decision. Designing for sheltering and social distancing comes up. It's easier to focus on these things if you've kind of locked down several of the decisions through Enerfit or Passive House. When you try to deal with everything on a building at the same time, especially with clients who aren't familiar with all these things, people get overwhelmed as you'd expect to get overwhelmed. So we find Passive House makes a great benchmark. It's not the answer to everything, but it's a great big first step that makes dealing with the other pieces easier. So in the Interfit plan, there's a tool. This is a snapshot of one where you sketch out your plans item by item, each component, each building characteristic, every piece of mechanical, and it's all kind of there in a grid. And you can talk through this again and again with the, the client and the contract, whenever you're working with and say, okay, maybe we're going to move up this, maybe we're going to move that, or maybe there's a grant coming out next year from the province to pay for X, Y, and Z. So we'll move those up, you know, into our first round because we can get some good grant support around them. And then how does that change our thinking going down? I mean, this, is, this should be a very lively discussion with the development team. The tool also has a cost serve where you can apply known costs to some of these things. Things. I think a great project for Passive House Canon, if we could find some money to support it, would be to go through costing data we have, which is very fluid right now, and create estimates for quite a few of these um, upgrades on single family home scale buildings across BC. And maybe Passive House Canada could issue this sheet of current cost estimates, or maybe working with a quantity surveyor or a construction firm or somebody as a partner and a sponsor, so that you could plug in ballpark numbers for costs on many of these upgrades and actually use this costing tool in a really effective way to plan out what each phase is gonna cost, which of course allows you to plan for your capital costs. And also think about the savings you might make as you get off, you know, if you get off your gas subject to the carbon tax this year versus 10 years from now, what are the difference in those 10 years and what else could you spend that money on? 
And then once the plan's put together, you try to put together a schedule and say, okay, these are the things I'm going to do each year. Obviously, if the pandemic's taught us anything is that life doesn't always go the way we planned. But having a plan to work from and to modify on a regular basis and checking in with your constructor and certifier every couple of years, say, okay, we've shifted this and we're going to do this now. And, you know, Aunt Phil died and we're going to, um, you know, have a little extra money this year that we didn't plan on. But having that schedule to work from is really important. And then the retrofit plan actually has a template set of letters. All of these charts I've showed you come out of the retrofit template, the interfit template. They can be modified. It's all in Excel. So you can just change whatever you need to do for your particular project. But it gives you a great starting point where you don't have to design, devise these documents from scratch. You just have to modify them for your particular use, including some overall letters. And you would um, have this all reviewed by a building certifier who would say, yep, yeah, if you proceed in that way, something like that, you know, I'll certify the building and get to the end of it. So again, you take your old building, you develop a master plan for where you wanna be in the future. And to be totally honest, the tool works just as well, even if you might decide mm, 25 kilowatt hours is a little optimistic, maybe on this really old building, 30s is what I'm gonna do with 35. The tool still works. The application and the, the way of going at this huge works. I urge any building to try for the 25 kilowatts or it's a little higher if you go up north in BC, but the approach and the tool makes sense regardless of your final decision. You do the whole plan, you work out the steps, you work out the costs, and they're actually required as part of the plan. You run this by a certifier who helps check you against other plans and see if you're on track. Uh, it shouldn't be a real expensive review initially. Uh, and then you start into your plan and carry on as you will. Um, it's meant to bring projects to Enterfit in a reasonable time, this, this past us retrofit plan, but I think it's a really good outline for preparing for all adaptation and mitigation approaches. So just to summarize here quickly, some of the key features of the stepwise version of Enterfit is you're preparing a PHP with the building owner, maybe with your contractor, your final outcome is determined. You don't pain yourself in corners, you don't lock yourself in low performance. And you've kind of guaranteed, your seed, guaranteed yourself some of the high marks, the regular quality marks of Passive House, um, great domestic hot water systems, cooling, efficient appliances, comfort. You can get cost estimates and savings in the process. For any cost estimate, the better your inputs, the better your outputs. Uh, and so maybe working together to develop some great inputs on some of these things would be really useful. The retrofits are typically broken into three or more steps. There's nothing preventing you from doing it all at once if you can afford it, but most buildings prefer a phased approach. And you can consider future codes, adaptation requirements, mitigation requirements, government programs, funding options. The plan is typically prepared by CPHC or CPHD. If you're thinking about doing that, Pass Pass Canada has some great cases and you can finish that. Uh, great courses and you can finish that. Uh, the plan is reviewed by accredited building certifier and there's quite a few of us in Canada who are happy to work with you on that and we're a growing group. Uh, and then you can get a plaque as early as 25% and a final plaque when it's all done. One of the first interfits in Canada is here in North Vancouver. It's, a Prince, it's on Princess Street in North Van. Uh, you can look it up on Pasco's database and you can download a little report about that project. I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's several years old now, but it's um, it's worth looking at. And one of the largest interfit plans in North America is was done all at once, not a step-wide basis. It's the Ken Sobel Tower. If you Google that, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but if you Google that, you can find out more. This is a picture of when it was brand new in 1967. It was that classic hopeful new high-rise family tower on the periphery of a large city. I love the kids playing in the pool on swing set. By the time they started going at it, the balconies had rotted significantly, and so they had to be sawed off. And so they sawed off the balconies, removed the old facade, um, which creates one of the biggest challenges for larger buildings. What do you do with balconies? You really only have three choices. Saw them off, wrap them completely with foam, or enclose them into the building enclosure, and there are real pros and cons for each option. That's what the building looked like in the fall, uh, at the end of 19. Uh, the windows were out, the balconies were off. Here's what it looks like finished. It was certified as an interfit building uh, recently in the last several weeks. Uh, it's a great looking project. The units look nice. They're super comfort. They see lots of advantages. You Google it. There's, a, there's great work out there on Ken Sobel. And there's quite a few other buildings in Canada that are looking at this model right now. And then there's one in New Haven, Connecticut. The Pirelli building is going to be a historic interfit retrofit of a classic brutalist tower uh, from, I think, the 70s. But check me on that. It's going to become a boutique hotel, preserving that look and style. Uh, but to interfit performance levels, obviously with interior insulation rather than exterior insulation. You can find out more about interfit at these links, and we'll make this PowerPoint available so we can find the links. Uh, when you go to the Passos database, just put in interfit and building type is the, the fast way to get there. I've kind of circled it there. 
RDH has published a couple of guides for climate change resiliency and a user's guide to ASHRAE 100, which guides our code in, in many places that are worth taking a look at. Some other great guides I found recently, if you're interested in basic climate history and science, the Good Sides More model is free. You just download that online. It's, and so is the Passive House Row House Manual. The Passive Row House Manual was put together by our friends at Green Building United in Philadelphia, which is a city full of these old row houses that are relatively affordable. It's shocking. You could go buy yourself a dozen row houses in Philadelphia for less than the cost of one house in Vancouver. Um, and it's a very specific guided manual for how to take that specific housing type and bring it up to a Passive House level. I think it would be really wonderful if we could produce something like the Pass House Rome model for classic Canadian single family archetypes that has that level of detail and discussion and yet aimed at homeowners. Um, I won't go through each of these or on the slides, but there's been a lot of good reporting on um, retrofits in Canada over the last two years in North America and a lot of it's worth reading. It'll really stimulate your thinking about some of these pieces. And finally, I'm just gonna mention that we talk about this approach, this, this need to weave in mitigation, adaptation, affordability, urbanization, all into our building considerations quite a bit. And of course, I teach for Passive House Canada called a pattern language from Passive House. And in that course, we really look for the overlaps where these circles come together and create something that's more affordable because it serves more than one need in this increasingly complex environment. Um, we're just about to start the new course. So if you've been thinking about doing it, or if you have any work involved in multi-unit housing specifically, or you're just interested in these ideas, or you just need to catch up on your credit hours to complete your CPHD or CPHD, and you suddenly need a quick 12 credits, or your, your, your credential is going to expire, uh, I'd be honored if you join us. We're running Tuesdays from February 8th to March 1. So it'll be every Tuesday morning Pacific time from 9 to noon. I think Luis will be there with me each time. So if you're thinking about that or no anybody's thinking about that, I'd urge you to go to the Passive House Canada page and look it up. Finally, I wanna share the perspective that retrofits are a form of hope. It's hard living in these times. COVID's hard enough without climate change barreling down around us. I think we all suffer from hope deficit some days. Retrofits are a physical manifestation of a commitment to live, a commitment to survive, a commitment to rebuild. And I think there's a kind of hope that comes from working on this that is important. Desmond Tutu passed away, as many of you know, not that long ago, and it caused lots of reviews. And, and this quote came up from him. There's nothing more difficult than waking up someone who's only pretending to be asleep. Of course, he was describing South African apartheid, where um, I, I believe I wasn't there, but I, I think what he meant is that many South Africans knew full and well they had a problem, what the problem was, and what needed to do to fix it, but they wanted to pretend it wasn't so. I feel exactly the same thing is happening with climate at this point in, certainly in Canada and many places in the world. I think most of our neighbors know what's happening, know what needs to be done to fix it. They just, it's more convenient to pretend to be asleep. They're waiting for someone else to take the leadership. So I think about this quote a lot. Nothing more difficult than waking someone who's only pretending to be asleep. My definition of asleep would be the fact that the average Canadian emits about 16 tons of greenhouse gas a person a year. And that to survive, to get to that 2030 target, we need to get to about two tons a person per year, ideal a little bit less. It's a big gap. And it's harder for us than and, and Americans and, and Europeans than it is, say, for many Africans and uh, Brazilians and uh, Indians and others, because they're already closer to two. Their, their gap to close is smaller than ours. But I think a lot of hope can be found in setting personal targets. Think about what you really want to do this year and what you can do and start monitoring and counting your own carbon emissions. There's a book that our friend Lloyd Alter published called Living the 1.5 Degree Lifestyle, where he did this for a year and he just describes the math he used in really simple terms. Writing a climate retrofit plan for your home, even if it's a rental building or something else, but think about what has to happen to this building can be helpful. Great practice to learn to use these tools or others. Get an e-bike. Um, our typical driving is four and a half tons a year. If we can even reduce that, if you can bring your driving down to one or two days a week and use an e-bike the other days a week, it's a huge chunk. If you're trying to get 16 and you can take four in just one category, that's massive. So the less we drive, I would also say as someone who's e-biked for about a year now, it's a lot of fun. I, I started part, as part of this experiment myself, but I stick with it because it's just fun. Um, flying less is a huge piece. Flying is about a quarter of a ton per hour. So every four hour flight, every flight from Vancouver to Toronto is another ton. And if you've got a two ton a year limit, one round trip to 
Toronto to Vancouver is pretty much use your annual limit right there. Uh, and so I think we really have to reconsider our flying and, and prioritize what's really important. Changing our diets to eat less meat, and I'm not advocating anybody has to become a vegan or a vegetarian, but just trim it way down, pull it back, make meat if you need to be that really special occasion you do with special people and you take the time to really enjoy the whole process, but not so much the quick hamburger or hot dog you pull, pull together when you're in a hurry. Buy less of everything, just limit the intake, limit the shipping, buy more local can affect these pieces a lot and talk about it. Don't suffer in silence. And, and that's, I think, especially important as we kind of live in this pandemic now. Talk with your neighbors about climate, what bugs you, what you're doing, what they're doing. Keep it fun, keep it funny. It doesn't have to be this dark thing. If all we're trying to do is do less than 16 tons, we're just trying to pull it down and then maybe next year come down a little farther. I think it's a fun topic to talk about without becoming overly strident or righteous or anything like that. Um, and I would act finally and supporting political action to end the fossil fuel era is another really important piece. But pick the pieces that work for you. Pick the parts that make it sense for you. So I'll leave with this photo of a guy in New Orleans during the flooding last year. I love this because this is a guy who is not bothered by climate change. He's got his beer. He's got a kayak. He's pulling up to his local bar. He's ready to go. He's not going to let this get him down too much. The core of what I'm saying is you take away nothing else here is every building needs a plan. Start thinking about how to plan for the buildings in your life for adapting to climate change before climate change adapts you and your building to it. And on that point, um, I see we have a bunch of things in the chat, but I can't read them yet. So I'm gonna stop sharing and hopefully we can open up this to a general discussion and, and try yeah, to let everybody have some say. So Monty, first of all, thank you. Thank you for this uh, great presentation. Um, every time I listen to you talk, it's you always bring something new. As you were saying about the, the pattern language course, I'm mean, like, I've, I, I think I said in what, three or four courses now, and every time there's something new. So it's always amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, on that note, um, we did have a lot of uh, comments here, but no questions yet. So if you'd like to ask any questions, just unmute yourself, raise your hand. You know you're more than welcome or type your questions. Um, on the side note, uh, we do now have uh, Passive House Canada has also developed a retrofit program. So if you're interested, please check, take a look in our website. This is also a 16 hour program that uh, takes you to uh, the deep retrofit, um, of course, for existing buildings. So the floor is open. So if you have any questions, just jump in. I see there are a lot of uh, can yeah, I respond to just a couple of the ones in chat? Just pick them off. I'm going to yeah. prioritize. I really like the question from, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Shirin Kazem. If I apologize if I mangled your name. Um, studying energy management, would like the information about Passive House for my thesis project. I read some articles about Passive House and Net Zero Energy Buildings. I would like to know the differences between Passive House and Net Zero Energy Buildings, as both of them focus on energy efficiency. It's a great question. It's a long answer, um, but I think it's important to understand the context. Um, most, and, and how you define net zero energy building is part of the answer, but most serious net zero energy buildings are essentially doing an annual energy balance and producing enough renewables energy in the summertime to cover the annual energy need. So you've got a bunch of solar usually, or sometimes community wind or other pieces, and you've done your annual, annual calculations and you're generating enough solar in the summer that you're giving to the power company and they're giving you back power in the winter for those winter peaks. It works well in some contexts. It creates some community problems. A net zero energy approach puts a real burden on the energy provider, the, the, the power companies. Um, they have to suddenly produce power at the hardest time of the year and try to sell it under regulated costs. And they're not getting the money during the easiest time of the year. Um, if one or two houses do net zero energy as a demonstration project, this is not a problem. But if whole communities converted to this net zero, this really seasonally unbalanced approach, it creates a problem for the power company. Conversely, something like the pass house approach, and there's many steps in between, there's no absolute right way to do these things, really works to shave off the peak loads, especially the peak loads in winter, uh, where you're just not requiring anywhere near as much energy during cold snaps, and, and shaving off the peak loads in summer too, through great shading of the building. Therefore, what you take from the grid or other power sources, you take at a more steady, level and by shaving off the peaks you're not leaning on the grid as much and so i think the one of the big differences comes in this approach of how much you do versus mechanical meaning solar and heat pumps versus how much you do in enclosure to shave off these peaks um, and i think the right answer depends on where you are it's it's my view that in most 
Canadian climates, the pass fast approach makes a lot more sense. We have really cold winters and increasingly hot summers. And so shaving off those peaks is really there. However, we worked with some clients in um, Southern and Central California where the, the sun and the cooling load coincide really well. The winters are fantastically mild. And you know you could probably do a net zero approach in those communities and be just as successful in those climates as we are with passive house here. So that's a simplistic way to put it. I think it gets more complicated in other places. And our advice on anything like that is to all our clients is understand your options and pick an option that makes sense for this building type, this building usage, this how old or new the building is. You know, there's no one right answer. I do urge any client who's saying, um, oh, pass fast is too expensive. It's a knee jerk reaction because they look at what it is. And I said, well, let's cost it and then decide that. Let's run something like this Enterfit tool and come up with a ballpark cost. And when you see the ballpark cost, if you decide it's too much, I think that's a legitimate response. If you say it's too much without having run the numbers, that's not a research-based number. That's just an opinion. Um, but lots of luck with that. And if, if you go to the PassFouse Institute website or the PassFouse Canada website, but especially the PHI website, and sort of Google around from there, you'll find an awful lot of research papers on exactly these topics as among others. Monty, there is another question here who came up from Daniel. Uh, can you talk more about electric domestic hot water approaches in multifamily retrofits? Yep. We encounter a lot of uh, pessimisms here in New York City from mechanical engineers about the options available. Yeah. So put yourself in the role of a consulting mechanical engineer. Here, here are two of the most true things. And I work with a lot of great mechanical engineers and, and we have several at RDH and, and I, you know, I have huge respect. Here are two things that are true for them. One, they never got in trouble for oversizing something. <laughs> never had a client who said, oh, my boiler's too big. You know, if they oversized it, the extra capacity was there and people just don't even think about it. But if they undersize something and people start to complain. So they, their knee jerk reaction is to make things bigger and, and add a safety margin because it just keeps them from being out of trouble. The second thing is, they, they generally get burned by new technologies. They've tried them over the years. Most come out of university and are excited by new technologies. They go through this and they kind of get beaten down and find using the tried and true things uh, allows them to not have problems, not have callbacks. And furthermore, they can kind of use the same drawings on client after client after client. So their profit margins as engineers goes up when you basically put the same thing in building after building after building after building. So their incentive is not to try the new thing. And that's part of why the resistance to electric heat pumps is out there. And it's true, we haven't had electric heat pumps widely installed in many projects in North America yet. However, they have been in Korea and Japan and parts of China and Europe. One of the things I was talking about doing with the BC Vancouver Economic Commission, before the pandemic, we were gonna see if we could arrange a tour to Japan of a bunch of engineers from mechanical engineers from Vancouver, specifically to walk around on roofs in Japan and look at large scale uh, uh, CO2 based water heat pumps on buildings and just bring a translator so that the engineers here could ask direct questions of the engineers and building operators there and just overcome that fear factor a bit. The pandemic hit and the idea of all getting on a plane to Japan together didn't seem so fun. Maybe we'll do it in the future, but um, getting over that fear factor is important. Um, I also say getting major manufacturers into the market is important. Most of our projects now are using the uh, Sandin system, which is really good. And, and sometimes even on larger buildings, you're using multiple Sandin systems, like one per floor, one, one every other floor. But I acknowledge that it's um, kind of a new product. Mitsubishi has been on the cusp of bringing in its large scale heat pumps for a couple of years. I think it got slowed a little bit down the pandemic, but it's such a well-known name that I think it'll help the market. And Mitsubishi tends to create good training and warranty programs for its pieces. So when the Mitsubishi CO2 air to water heat pumps come in, I think some of that resistance will go away. And similarly, I hear that Daikin's on the cusp of bringing in its large system. So I think having the major manufacturers, a couple of them in the market will help with that. But I understand why mechanical people are resistant. Um, I think it's important to communicate to owners that these are not like some of the geothermal systems or um, radiant hot water, you know, the big panels on the roof, the, the radiant exchange hot water systems we use that, that have had not great track records. They've had track records. These are systems that have been working day in and day out on Asian buildings for decades. It's just a matter of pulling them over here, changing the power supplies and learning to install properly to them. Hope that helps. 
It does indeed, Monty. Monty, we have a couple more questions that came up here. Uh, one is from Sean. Sean asks, how do we uh, convert energy advisors to use PHPP instead of Hot 2000? I, I see that uh, um, Paul made, I think it was Paul. Yeah, Paul also made a, a comment here. So if you want to comment on that one, there's a lot of questions popping up, but uh, I guess it's a good topic as well. Yep. So full disclosure, I started as an energy advisor. Uh, I was an energy advisor for several years before I discovered Passivhouse. So I used Hot 2000 on a little less than a thousand different buildings. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with it and its process. And I would say um, at its best, Enercan runs a great ecosystem for energy advisors. There are trainers, there are quality assurance programs, there are reviews, they have a computer that does basic checks when you turn in a Hot 2000 file and make sure a few things are in place. Over decades, they've developed a whole ecosystem in which Hot 2000 can deliver consistent repeatable results by a wide variety of energy advisors, some of whom are fantastically well-educated in building science and others of whom became an energy advisor at a weekend workshop, you know, two weeks ago and are just kind of feeling their way along. And that's an incredible accomplishment. And building out that network is important to the retrofit future of Canada. Unfortunately, the network shriveled a lot in the years after the Harper era program, because everything kind of collapsed and lots of energy advisors, including I think many of the best ones, kind of had to find something else to do for a living. Um, I was super lucky. I had started modeling the passive house and doing other things. And so it was an easy transition for me to move over to passive house, but not as easy for everybody else. Um, there was a survey out just weeks ago. I participated and I think some other EAs did um, asking about next versions of Hot 2000. And some of the questions were about, should it be more like PHPP? Should it be an Excel based program? And I, I certainly I suspect I was the minority in filling out that survey, but I certainly encourage that. I think that the programs that write the grants will determine the software. And if we have grant programs from our province and the federal government that allowed PHPP as an alternative path for software, it'll take off and it'll be fine. If the program requires you to do Hot 2000 and it's only a house size project, why well, are you going to do it twice? It's just an awful lot to pay to do it twice um, in these two other ways. Um, so I think, you know, working with governments to include Hot 2000 as an alternative is really important. I would say this too, a few years ago, and I think this is changing. I think this is the thing technically that I'm a little behind on, but 10 years ago, when we ran some comparisons between Hot 2000 and PHPP, what we found was that Hot 2000 was more accurate on a middling performance house. PHPP overestimated the energy needed from a like two by four, two by six simple frame wall house. PHPP overestimated the amount of energy needed in a passive house or a net zero project. So it was clear they each worked really well for their intended purpose, but they didn't work as well for the other purpose for very specific reasons and how the programs go together. Um, and we'd have to resolve those issues if we were to use both for high performance homes a little bit. I know that's a little more of a technical answer. But... Monty, excellent. There is another, there are so many questions here. We still like to go to the breakout rooms, but let's keep the questions coming. So that's, I think it's uh, a little bit more interesting though. So Jamie here asks, Monty, how important do you think building energy ratings, for example, uh, existing buildings will be in the retrofit nudge? I think literacy around home energy performance will remain low uh, without this. Yep. Uh, EU grade from A to F, is very simple for everyone to understand. Yeah, I think we know that home energy ratings are a really valuable tool. This has been talked about as long as I've been in this business, like at least 14, 15 years, you know? Um, it requires just the political will for some government to say, yes, we're gonna do it. And there've been several proposals out there and it's just kind of died on the vine every few years. But um, I think, let me make a case for it and let me make a case against it. First, I'll make the case against it. In a market like Metro Vancouver, and I think probably Victoria and many other places, where there is such an extreme housing shortage, it's a seller's market. And people are buying homes and condos without even getting inspections because they're afraid they won't get it. If they're buying a home without an inspection, I suspect they're not going to be influenced by an energy label. They're just so desperate to get in the market to get that place that they're going to accept whatever deficits that exists because they want the place and they feel they have to get in the market uh, for financial reasons. So when we're in a time of such extreme 
housing deficit, it's probably true that the energy label is not gonna be very effective. It's not gonna make a big difference on things. And I, I hate to say that, but I think it's true. However, the evidence when we had the slowdown in 2008, you know, and there was like a couple of years there when things were soft, there was a great study in California that showed that homes with energy labels uh, or like a lot of solar power or other things sold faster and sold for more than those without. As soon as the market turns and the buyers have a little power, they really want that information and they would prioritize that information and they would pay more for the houses with great energy labels and pay less for those with poor energy labels. So I think it makes sense to start it in hopes that we'll bring the rest of our housing mess into line over the next three or four years and that this will be a tool in place when that happens. I just think it's also worth being honest and kind of sanguine that in this insane market, I, I would question how effective it would be immediately. Anybody else want to disagree with that? You're welcome to. And that's something that I noticed, Monty. As you know, I'm I'm Brazilian and, and checking the market here for housing is just it's just crazy. I'm like there is a housing industry, 1.5 million sold like in two days. And I'm like, what? Like 1.5 million is out of the blue. Anyway, it's just, it's just crazy. Monty, some more questions for you, buddy. Um, uh, one from Jonathan here. It's, uh, I heard that let's on windows. I work with grants on some parts and they aren't tested with frames. So aren't allowed in most of the grants. Anyone have experience with them? Let's on windows. Have you heard about that? What's the, what, what kind of window? Uh, light zone windows. I guess I don't I know exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, Jonathan, you're here with us still, or maybe for a not bunch anymore? Of film. Yeah. I'm, I'm here. Two layers of glass with a bunch of film in between. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Um, th that family of products of film layers in between windows held a lot of promise and resulted in a tremendous amount of drama and problems on installation. One of the biggest problems in Canada, maybe the world, is the wall center tower. Uh, oh yeah, there you got an example. The wall center tower is a triple with a film in the middle and the film tensioners pulled in creating holes and let air into the IGUs. And so they were fogging up and creating condensation. And actually RDH created a custom scaffold and replaced all the windows on the upper half of the tower, on the condo section of the tower from those, they opted not to do the hotel. So you actually look at the tower and you can see a change in glass about a third of the way up. And the bottom half is the hotel that still has the uh, film windows. And if you go to the hotel and stay in a room, you can see them. Uh, we had our Christmas party there this year. We got a long relationship with the building and the owner. Um, and the room I was in actually of the four IGUs on the wall, two were broken and had, you know, bugs in them and, and condensation and sort of little bits of mold around the edge. So projects like that gave the suspended film a bad reputation. And I don't have enough experience to know whether the newer manufacturers have solved all those problems and they're fine or not. The alternate to that that I'm really curious about seeing is there's at least one manufacturer that's using thin glass, like the stuff that's on your iPhone cover, this really, really thin glass that's your touchpad, where the outer panes are thick conventional glass and there'd be like two inner panes of thin glass enabling you to do a quad pane unit and approximately the IGU width of a triple unit. I just put a link to something for that in the thing. Great. Thanks, Ian. It's great to see you, by the way. Yeah. Um, Pierre sent me that the other day, so that's why. So I think for a lot of these new products, you know, if you're doing a single family home and you have a modest um, willingness to take risk and you have a good warranty and you're confident that if, if it breaks, your supplier will come and give you a new IGU and put it in, go for it. I think you're going to find large commercial developers are extremely resistant to try new gazing solutions after the wall center problem and others of that era. They all knew what happened. So even as we're trying to talk about vacuum glass on a large project, the first thing people cite is the wall center and what happened there. So I think we're going to have to get past that. But I do think Quad panes, vacuum glass are important solutions. Second to just using less glass. <laughs> you know, if we design buildings at 25 to 35% window area rather than 50 to 60% window area, um, we can do quite a bit with simple triples and not need these more exotic technologies. That said, I'm for an all above solution. And on 
one of our projects, the project at 1075 Nelson Street, which is this high expensive glass of uh, condominium tower, we are looking at all of these options. Uh, and we will be probably doing some kind of very high performance glass on that building. And we're having a very vibrant discussion internally and with manufacturers about which, which will be the most durable over time. You just don't want a failure 60 stories up. It's hard to repair. Yeah, so um, now everyone, uh, we still have some questions, but uh, I'd like to take you now to a breakout room session so you can uh, do a little bit of interaction. Oh. So it's just, uh, as we're not here in person, just try to socialize, get to know each other if you don't know. So if you, if you know them, you know, just uh, catch up. So Gusha is going to put everyone now in three different groups. So enjoy. It's going to be only 10 minutes. Believe me, 10 minutes just fly by. It's too fast. So try to take the best out of it. And we're trying to make this a little bit more in-person style, which, you know, trying to make it a little bit more human contact as much as you can. So, Gushi, you can take it away, please. Luiz, when a gente estava começando a ter fã, você cortou o barato. Meu amigo Fábio. Oh, sorry, guys. So this is a, a, a fellow Brazilian here in the room. Uh, yeah. So 10 minutes, it's it's not enough, right? So we kind of saw it's not enough at all. So we're kind of just going through as well. We didn't even finish, you know, going around. But uh, I guess we have another round of breakout rooms so we can, you know, mingle again, talk a little bit. What I found was we started introducing ourselves and then boom, time was up. Uh, but the time started to go and since get better, we just lost it. But uh, sorry, Fabio, but, you know, if we keep longer, it's just we're not going to be able to mingle and get to know a little bit more of uh, each other here. I will be honest, I don't know about you guys, but 20 minutes just flew. Um, but uh, anyways, so now we're back. Uh, you see that the, even the number of people reduced it. So if you could take one, 30 seconds, if you could just put on the chat ideas for our next meeting, just something you'd like to see. If you don't have any, that's also fine. But uh, we'd love to come up with uh, more um for example, to beat Mont's presentation is going to be hard as, you know, Monty is going to, it's not a, it, I like to call Monty not a, I mean, like a, in a nice way, he's kind of a, the dinosaur of passive house in Canada. The dinosaur due to the fact, you know, he's one of the first ones. And I mean, it's, uh, it's, sorry, sorry, Monty. I mean, like it, it's in a nice way. Just, I just don't know another word to put it, but it's kind of, a, it's the, the, the ones who started this movement here in Canada, <laughs> and uh, and this guy, every time I listen to him talk, it's just it's just hard to get you know better than what he does. But uh, first, Monty, thank you, thank you once again, man. I mean, like you're a very you're one of the best advocates that I, I see here, and uh, you're always open for for me to call you and ask questions. So thank you very much. And uh, before we wrap it, if you can put something on the uh, chat as well, what you'd like to see it, we'll just keep the chat for us to check later. And Monty, if you have any final words, so thank you once again. In the name of Passive House Canada and the whole Passive House community, thank you, buddy. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's, I hope we can do it in person soon. And for those of you who are just starting, just take your time. Take it slow. You know, it's like there's a tremendous amount of resource in Canada. Just figure out one step at a time ways to tap into it and keep making progress. In no time at all, you'll have been doing this for, I mean, in one other industry is 10 years, 12 years considered a really long time. <laughs> and I would add to that if my son here, his first question would be, what kind of dinosaur is he? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but the good ones, the good ones, you know, the ones that's actually starting the, the whole movement. So I do appreciate, uh, do appreciate it. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you for joining. And uh, I hope to see you on the next uh, uh, Passive House Pulse. Thank you, everybody.